start with grafting is a subject which strictly speaking cannot be taught in a session or a lecture is something which has to be learned through experience uh but i'll try to share a few of my experiences on the do's and the don'ts which i have learned over these years from my seniors from my colleagues as to what are the common mistakes that we do make while drafting a repetitive and what are the things you need to avoid to ensure that you get a good draft of the repetition uh generally when you are drafting anything you must be clear as to what you need to achieve out of your draft so accordingly you plan your drafting now yes wow yes uh, so basically for any draft whether it be a writ petition or even a simple notice that you may have to send as an advocate a legal notice that you may have to send every single act which you do must be planned in such a manner that it achieves the purpose for which it is being done so therefore there has to be a proper planning before you actually execute the final draft it has to be precise concise avoid any sort of a repetition in your drafts also it has to be structured in a manner uh, in accordance with suppose you are drafting a writ petition for instance it has to conform with the applicable rules of the court in which you are filing that particular petition apart from that you also need to be sure about the substantive laws you must have the knowledge of the substantive laws in order to be able to properly formulate your grounds in your petition or your notice most important is the clarity of thought and free flow of all the narration of facts whether it be in the notice or in your writ petition your objective as i said earlier is to ensure that you are able to convey what you expect the court to grant you in the most clear form possible so therefore when you are drafting anything whether it be a petition or an application or even a simple notice the most important part of it is the concluding part where you ask for the reliefs for your client uh i'm sure most of you must have seen the jolly llb movies whether it be the first one or the second one you must be distinctly remembering that arshad varsi in one of the jolly llb movies files a pil in a district court in uttar pradesh now one this happens because the filmmakers did not actually do the basic study that a pil can never lie before a district court can anyone tell me the reason for that i basically intend to have an interactive sort of a session so you can type out your comments or answers to my queries in the chat box can anyone tell me why a pil cannot lie in a district court it's basically a red petition yes right that's right it's actually a writ petition where the petitioner is espousing the cause of many people who by whatever disabilities or economic or otherwise are not able to present their case by themselves before a court of law so it's basically a writ petition and district court uh, yeah i'm getting one comment that district court is a court of trial uh, let me correct you for most civil cases the trial court where the first as in the court of first instance uh, as far as the state of maharashtra is concerned the trial court could either be the court of civil judge junior division or the court of civil judge senior division the district court could generally have appellate jurisdiction barring certain uh, specific jurisdiction conferred under certain special acts it is generally a appellate court so basically a writ petition under article 226 can lie only before the high court and therefore the writ can either lie before the high court under 226 or under article 32 before the supreme court and therefore the pil can only be in the high court or the supreme court it could not 
can never be in the district court similarly you must have seen i think akshay kumar in the second jolly llb movie he just flashed papers before the judge and he just threw away and said this this, this is the thing which i am filing and all sorts of things now that really doesn't happen in real court unless of course it's some additional thing which you are tendering in a court of law during the course of your arguments but generally you are supposed to file the petition in the registry of the court so if it's a writ petition you file it in the registry of the high court you have a separate administrative setup for that where you are supposed to file it the actual arguments are obviously take place before the judge but the filing happens in a separate administrative department of the high court uh coming to our topic specifically drafting of a writ petition uh as you all are aware there are five kinds of writs so even the first year students would know that there are five kinds of writs habeas corpus uh certiorari prohibition mandamus and quo warranto so for any of these five writs you can file a writ uh let me tell you the most commonly used writs are habeas corpus certiorari and mandamus quo warranto cases are uh, relatively few in number prohibition yes but mostly they are certiorari now you know the difference between prohibition and certiorari the stage at which you approach determines whether you are ask whether you ask for the relief of prohibition or for the relief of certiorari certiorari is when the final order has already been passed and you are seeking quashing of that order you are seeking cancellation of that order in simple terms then you ask for a writ of certiorari whereas prohibition is a case where you feel that a subordinate authority is proceeding with a matter with a case where it ex facie does not have any jurisdiction or if you feel that that authority is exceeding jurisdiction or exercising jurisdiction not vested in it by law in such a case you apply for a writ of prohibition but in most cases you would either come to the high court for a writ of certiorari or in the case of habeas corpus when there is unauthorized illegal detention you file a case uh, you will file a writ seeking a writ of habeas corpus and mandamus uh is another most often used uh writ and for mandamus uh, there are four essentials uh, can anyone tell me what are the four essentials of a writ of mandamus uh for those who have done already studied their constitution law they would know what are the essentials of a writ in a writ of for a writ of uh mandamus can anyone tell me what are the essentials yes uh am i audible to all yes sir yes sir you audible sir yes yeah so you have a legal right which is violated you make a demand for enforcement of that right and the public authority refuses to enforce that right in such a case you approach the high court seeking a writ of mandamus okay so that's another most often used uh, uh, writ writ of mandamus apart from writ of certiorari and writ of Uh, habeas corpus so now going to the basics of drafting a writ petition uh the first and foremost thing uh can anyone tell me who has to be the respondent in a writ petition uh i i intend to have a interactive session so if the comments are most welcome otherwise it would be just a one way traffic right it has to be the state and the reason for that is uh writs lie against the state or the instrumentalities of the state and what is a state 
is mentioned in Article Twelve of the Constitution. Okay, so whether it be any department of the state government, or it could also be, uh, it could be any corporation established under any special statute. So it can be, for instance, the Mumbai Municipal Corporation. It is also an instrumentality of the state against which a writ would lie. Or you have authorities under the Maharashtra Cooperative Societies Act, like you have uh, the registrar, the divisional joint registrar, or the assistant registrar, or the district deputy registrar, who who may pass orders which are subject to challenge by way of a writ petition. Similarly, you have authorities like Mada, that is the Maharashtra Housing and Area Development Authority, or the Slum Rehabilitation Authority, the SRA, who may pass certain orders, which can also be the subject matter of challenge before the High Court in a writ petition. So the first thing that you would do while drafting a writ petition is you will have what is known as the long cost title. Now, what is a long cost title? Now, long cost title essentially starts with the name of the court in which you are filing the case. So, for instance, you are filing a case in the Bombay High Court against the Mumbai Municipal Corporation. In that, and you are filing it in the High Court. Mumbai Municipal Corporation is based in Mumbai. Therefore, the writ would lie on the original side of the High Court. So, the first line in your long cost title would be in the High Court of Judicature at Bombay which indicates the court in which you are filing the case. The second line indicates the jurisdiction that you have invoked of the court. So since you are filing it against the Mumbai Municipal Corporation, your second line would be extraordinary because it's a writ jurisdiction. So it's an extraordinary jurisdiction. And since you are filing on the original side of the High Court, it would be extraordinary original jurisdiction. The third line would be the nature of proceedings that you have filed. So it would be writ petition number dash of and the year. So writ petition number, for instance, one of 2021. Thereafter, you have to mention the district from which it arises. Since it's on the original side, obviously it arises from the Mumbai district. Thereafter, you mention in brief the provisions under which you have filed that particular writ petition. So, for instance, it's a writ petition challenging a demolition order issued by uh, BMC. So, for instance, you must have heard of late uh, the case which was in the news was that of uh, Kangana Ranaut's uh, bungalow's uh, illegal demo demolition by BMC. So, in that case, you first mention in the matter of Article 14 and 226 of the Constitution, then you would mention and in the matter of Section 351 of the Mumbai Municipal Corporation Act 1888. And thereafter, and in the matter of arbitrary demolition of my bungalow at so and so. Thereafter, you start with the description of the party. So, for instance, you are take, if you take Kangana's case, then you will mention Kangana, Ranath, uh, age, occupation, complete postal address petitioner versus the first petitioner in this case would be the Mumbai Municipal Corporation. So your first versus number one would be Municipal Corporation of Greater Mumbai with their complete address represented through its commissioner. Thereafter, you would mention the particular authority or the ward officer of the concerned ward who did this act. So that would be your second respondent. And if you need to add, if you're making any sort of any allegation against any third official of BMC, that would be your third respondent. So basically, this entire thing forms part of your long cost title, starting from in the High Court of Judicature at Bombay, extraordinary original civil jurisdiction, writ petition number so and so of 2021 onwards, up till full description of both petitioners and respondents. This entire thing forms your long cost title. So having all necessary and proper parties as party respondents in your petition is very, very crucial. Now, the reason for that is if you fail to make any uh, necessary or uh, proper party as a party respondent in your red petition, then you cannot claim any reliefs against that party. 
and if you are making any sort of an any allegation against any particular official of any government department then he must get an opportunity to meet the case to put up his defense and therefore it is extremely important that you make all of them party respondents even if you are making it, it's not mandatory that all the parties in a writ petition have to be state or instrumentalities of the state you can also have other private parties in addition to the state as party respondents in a writ petition uh, i'll share one experience which happened just two weeks back uh, i was for i was on behalf of a developer who was not joined as a party in the writ petition the petitioner was a cooperative housing society which had filed a writ petition before the high court and they had made the mumbai municipal corporation as well as the fire officer of the mumbai municipal corporation as party respondents they had also joined the state of maharashtra as party respondent their case in brief was that the developer had made certain unauthorized alterations in the building of the society while redeveloping the building and he had contrary to the approved or the sanctioned building plans shifted the refuge area from one place to the other and had actually reduced the size of the refuge area which had consequently resulted in issues of fire safety now i hope you all are aware about what a refuge area is so if you have high rises anything in excess of seven story buildings then you are required to keep certain area vacant from the eighth floor onwards so if it's a multi story building above seven floors then generally on the eighth floor you have to keep a portion of the eighth floor completely vacant so in case there is a situation of a fire then all the residents can uh, come down or wherever they are in the building and if they are not able to go out of the building then they can assemble in that refuge area till the fire engines can come and rescue them so that that is the concept of a refuge area so the mumbai municipal corporation uh, while approving the building plans also uh, takes into consideration whether the a provision has been made for refuge area so the petitioner society in my case had come before the court alleging that the refuge area was not as per the sanctioned plan and that had resulted in serious issues of fire safety and because of the threat of fire and consequent threat to the lives of the residents the society had approached the court saying that the fundamental rights of its members were affected and therefore the court should pass necessary orders directing uh, that the refuge uh, floor should be restored to its original site original size and at the original location now that would have meant that a flat which was already constructed and which was occupied by a member of the society itself would have had to be demolished and shifted to another place the society for whatever reason whether they were ill advised or otherwise did not join that flat owner who was who is also a member of the society who would be affected by the order of the court as a party respondent neither did they join the developer as a party because the developer they were they had made several allegations against the developer saying alleging malafides and collusion with the officers of the corporation which had resulted in the refuge area being shifted now when the court when the case came up before the court uh, before the first court presided over by the honorable chief justice of the bombay high court after hearing both the parties the court apart from dismissing the case on merits also made a very important observation and one of the reasons which it based for dismissing the writ petition of the society was that allegations were made against the society against the developer and a relief was sought which would have affected the rights of one of the members who was a flat uh, owner in the society and obviously both of them were not made parties and therefore the petition as it was filed was defective for non joinder of necessary parties and therefore that was one of the principal grounds on which the petition was dismissed leave aside on, on the merits therefore it's of paramount importance that whenever you are drafting a writ petition you must 
know who all are to be joined as party respondents because a small mistake of failing to join an important party against whom you intend to claim reliefs or against whom you are making any sort of allegations any failure to join such a party as a party respondent can be fatal as you have just heard from my experience okay so therefore it's very important to join all necessary and proper parties apart from the state as well as party respondents in your writ petition so that's one part of it who should be the parties the next thing is you start with the narration of the facts uh before starting with the narration of facts uh, there are different styles of drafting a writ so one of the styles styles is uh, if you have to convey the gist of your writ petition in one paragraph you start the opening paragraph of your writ petition would contain the gist of your entire writ petition thereafter the next paragraph can be uh, the description of the parties so who is the petitioner uh, what is his background and all other details thereafter description of the respondents now in the description of the respondents as i began by saying you must ensure that all e either any of the departments of the state or the state or any of the instrumentalities of the state or any statutory corporation is a party respondent because a writ can lie only against the state or the instrumentalities of the state within the meaning of article 12 so your second para would be description of the parties thereafter you start narrating the facts so the narration of facts would generally again here there are different styles there is no hard and fast rule but one of the styles adopted is you start every para in the narration of the facts with the words the petitioner states that or if there are multiple petitioners then the petitioners state that and then you narrate the whole thing so that is how you will have uh, the narration of facts in chronologically numbered paragraphs so 3 4 5 6 onwards you narrate all the facts chronologically uh again important you need to narrate all the material facts so that's a call that you have to take while drafting the petition you need not incorporate unnecessary details only material details which are required for the adjudication by the court on the dispute which is involved in the case uh thereafter most important after you have narrated all the facts the next thing is the legal grounds so you have to state again chronologically what are your legal grounds uh before you do that in your narration of facts wherever you have got any supporting document uh for a particular fact you are expected to annex a copy of that to the petition so, so for instance uh, take kangana's case where uh, assuming she was uh, challenging a notice or an a notice of demolition then her in her narration wherever whichever paragraph she states that Uh, i was issued so and so notice under section 351 on so and so date thereafter a statement has to be added or an averment that a copy of the notice dated so and so is annexed here with and marked as exhibit a b c whatever okay so that's how in the narration of the facts itself wherever you have a supporting document you annex a copy of it and you refer to it as exhibit a b c d again in chronological order once you are done with the narration of the facts the next thing is legal grounds now as far as legal grounds are concerned uh depending on the writ which you are claiming so if it's a writ of certiorari you know what are the grounds under which you can ask for a writ of certiorari for instance if there is violation of principles of natural justice or if the authority has exceeded its jurisdiction while passing the order or if an authority has exercised a jurisdiction not vested in it by law or if an authority has failed to exercise a jurisdiction which is vested in it by law or if it has failed to consider relevant materials or if it has taken into consideration any irrelevant materials while passing an order 
so these are different grounds which are available to you for those who are still in the first year you will learn all these grounds when you study administrative law okay so these are different grounds under which you can seek judicial review of an order passed by any subordinate authority okay so broadly these are the grounds which you would have uh, which you would incorporate in the legal grounds while drafting the writ petition when you are seeking a writ of certiorari if you are seeking a writ of mandamus as i discussed earlier you will have to state that this is your legal right under so and so law or this is your fundamental right and you have made a demand for justice to that authority saying that so and so right has been violated please uh, grant me relief and that authority has failed to give you uh, justice in spite of the demand made by you and therefore you are coming by way of the writ petition seeking uh, the writ of mandamus okay so on those grounds you correlate the facts with the grounds which are available qua that particular writ and you accordingly formulate your legal grounds now legal grounds formulation of legal grounds is the most important part of your writ petition because when you are claiming the reliefs you need to properly uh, draft your legal grounds and that will come of course with experience and most importantly with the knowledge of substantive law as well as procedural law so for instance when you say principles of natural justice you know that giving notice prior notice is one of the important facets of uh, notice as well as giving audi ultram partum that is also giving an opportunity of hearing before any order adverse order having civil consequences is passed against you okay, so in either case if you have not been given any notice or if the notice is defective for whatever reason or you have not been given an opportunity of hearing or for instance another facet of principles of natural justice is that the order has to be a speaking order now what do you mean by a speaking order a speaking order is an order which is supported by reasons so suppose an order is passed by bmc for instance saying that your structure is unauthorized therefore demolish without stating how it is unauthorized on what basis on what material they have concluded that it is unauthorized then obviously you can challenge it by way of writ of certiorari and say that it is a non speaking order and therefore in violation of principles of natural justice and therefore a writ of certiorari may be granted quashing the order of the corporation or for instance uh, take a in case where assuming kangana had submitted certain documents to show that the structure was actually authorized and legal but the authority the officer of the ward officer of pmc who passes that order final order does not even refer to that then it amounts to non consideration of relevant material and that again becomes a ground to seek a writ of certiorari against the order which is passed by the bmc okay so this is how you formulate the different legal grounds in the writ once you have finished drafting the grounds that's the most important part of your writ petition before you move to the prayers there are certain things which there are certain averments which are required to be mandatorily included in the draft of the writ petition so one of them is the cause of action and the territorial jurisdiction so you need to state where the cause of action has arisen so uh, in my example where i said that it's bmc uh, who has issued the notice obviously the cause of action has arisen in the city of mumbai and therefore the bombay high court on its original side has got territorial jurisdiction to entertain the writ uh, just to divert divert a bit uh, for, especially for the first year students uh, the high court the bombay high court has got the original jurisdiction as well as the appellate jurisdiction now broadly speaking when you are uh, considering from the point of view of the territorial jurisdiction part of it original jurisdiction would be exercised by the bombay high court when the cause of action arises within the limits of greater mumbai so within the limits of city of mumbai so whether it be from south mumbai all the way from kulaba kapparet 
all the way up to on the eastern side you have up to mulund and on the western side up to the hisar and on the harbor line on the harbor side you have up to i think mankhurd so these are the limits of the original jurisdiction of the bombay high court so if any cause of action arises within the city limits of mumbai then a writ would lie on the original side of the bombay high court but if it arises outside mumbai say for instance it arises uh instead of mumbai municipal corporation assume that it's a notice which is issued by a neighboring municipal corporation like say thane thane municipal corporation or navi mumbai municipal corporation or pune municipal corporation then in such a case the cause of action arises outside the limit city limits of mumbai and therefore a writ against these corporations would lie on the appellate side of the bombay high court okay so that's the distinction uh between the appellate side and the original side of the high court so in our case since it's arising in mumbai therefore an averment to the effect that the cause of action has arisen has arisen in the city of mumbai and therefore this honorable court has jurisdiction to entertain the writ petition so an averment to that effect will have to be uh, stated in your draft of writ petition after the grounds after you have stated all the legal grounds another common averment that you need to incorporate is that of non availability of an alternate efficacious remedy uh, as you start doing uh, reading up more and more case laws you come to know that though there is no embargo in the constitution whether it be under article 226 or under article 32 on the supreme court or the high court to exercise writ jurisdiction but as a matter of practice and as a matter of self restraint generally the high court or the supreme court would not exercise their writ jurisdiction unless the party coming before the court has exhausted any other alternative efficacious remedy that may be available to that party under the under any of the special laws so for instance uh, to uh, give you an example uh, take a very basic example of say there's a dispute between the member of a cooperative society and the cooperative society say over a parking issue now in such a case there is a remedy available to the member to file a dispute against the uh, society before the cooperative court and that dispute would lie under section 91 of the maharashtra cooperative societies act if you are in the state of maharashtra each state has got its own cooperative laws so in that case the first remedy that that party would have to exhaust is by filing a dispute under section 91 of the cooperative court but assuming he comes straight away uh he comes straight by way of a writ petition uh, against the society obviously such a petition would not be entertained by the high court firstly on the ground that there is an alternative efficacious remedy secondly also on the ground that the society can always raise a dispute that it is not a state within the meaning of article 12 and therefore a writ would not lie against the society but that apart uh there could also be uh, other alternative efficacious remedies like under the uh say for instance uh revenue laws so for instance you have to got the maharashtra land revenue code of 1966 now under the maharashtra land revenue code there is a hierarchy provided uh, of different authorities before whom you can first approach so for instance first you can approach the sdo or the sub divisional officer then you go to the collector in appeal against that you can go up higher up to the additional commissioner against that you can file a revision before the at at mantralay as in before the minister or any uh, officer any secretary revenue secretary who may have been authorized by the minister Okay, so there's a hierarchy provided from SDO collector, additional commissioner, then to the state government, and then you come by way of uh, Article two twenty six or two twenty seven in the High Court. Now, if you jump the gun 
and come straight against an order of the collector instead of approaching the additional commissioner and the state government first if directly against the order of collector if you come by way of a writ petition then the court may not entertain your petition saying that you first had to exhaust your alternative remedies which are provided under the statute okay so therefore this averment is very important where you have to state that there is no alternative efficacious remedy or you have to state that there is an alternate remedy which is available under the law but in the facts of a given case how it is not efficacious and therefore you are requesting the court to directly exercise its swift jurisdiction so this would be a clause where you state that there is no alternative efficacious remedy or that if there is one it has already been availed of the next averment which is mandatory is in respect of delay or latches now strictly speaking uh, period of limitation you must have studied the law of limitation those who are in the final year uh, you must have st studied the limitation act of 1963 now there is a schedule at the end of the act after the sections there is a schedule to the limitation act now that schedule provides what are the time periods within which you can file institute a particular case it does not provide for filing of a writ petition okay so the law of limitation stricto sensu limitation act 1963 does not apply to writ petitions but what the court generally sees is whether the petitioner has come before it at the earliest possible instance whether he has not been sleeping over his rights so for all the first year students those who have done specific relief act one of the important principles you must have studied and learned in professor pithawala's uh, classes is that uh, equity uh, he who does equity uh, gets equity or uh, he who sleeps over his rights cannot expect equity okay so the law would not come to the aid of a party who sleeps over his rights so if you have if a cause of action has arisen say in the year 2015 and you have been sleeping over your rights for last 6 years and suddenly you come before the court and say no no i want a writ of uh, uh writ of uh, say mandamus the court will say what were you doing for all these 6 years you should have come at the earliest possible instance now though there is no limitation that a writ has to be filed within 3 Three months, ninety days, or within three years. There is no such limitation. Nonetheless, the court will look at the con at the conduct of the petitioner, whether he has come to the court at the earliest possible instance, and if at all he has come at a belated stage, whether he has a plausible justification for coming late. Because many of the writ petitions are dismissed on this preliminary point that you have not approached the court at the earliest possible time. So that is a concept of what is known as latches. it's spelled as l a c h e s okay so principle of latches or l a t c h e s latches means where there is a delay which is unexplained which has resulted in the other party uh acting uh having changed its position during the interregnum so in such cases if there is unreasonable delay the court will not come to your aid so therefore there an averment has to be included that if at all there is any delay or latches then what is the explanation for that delay or latches the next averment that you need to include is as regards balance of convenience so you need to explain how passing of any reliefs in your writ petition will be to your benefit and how that benefit is more than any prejudice or loss that may be caused to the respondent okay so that's one of the important averments that if this reliefs are granted no prejudice would be caused to the respondents but if the reliefs are not granted in favor of the petitioner then grave loss and prejudice would be caused to the petition so that's another averment as regards balance of convenience thereafter another important averment that you need to include is as regards uh, you have studied the principle of res judicata i believe uh, in section 11 of cpc so there cannot be uh, more than one case in respect of the same dispute same subject matter between the same parties which has already been decided or even if it's pending you cannot come before another court for the same subject matter so therefore an averment 
to the effect that there is no earlier case pending or that you have not filed any case seeking the same reliefs before any other court or even before the same court which has been dismissed or whichever is pending so you have to include a averment that there is no other case pending or no other case filed in respect of the same subject matter either before the same court or any other court okay so an averment to that effect is important thereafter another important thing is an averment to state uh how will the court come to know it it's the petitioner who's affirming on oath that there is no other case filed if the respondent comes up and shows to the court that uh, the petitioner has lied and made a false statement on oath then the petitioner will have to bear the consequences including the court may dismiss his petition for not coming to court with clean hands again a principle of equity which is applied uh, by the red courts so if you have lied to the court while making that averment that there is no other uh, case filed and in fact if the respondent comes up with a proof that you had already filed another case which is pending or which has been dismissed dismissed then you will have to bear the consequences of it therefore you have to make true and full disclosures when you are drafting your writ petition the next thing regarding caveat now as far as the caveat is concerned uh, i think only the final year students may have some idea about this there's a there's a provision under section 148 capital a section 148 capital a of the code of civil procedure which makes a provision for caveat now what is a caveat uh, a caveat is basically an application which is filed in the court saying that i apprehend that so and so party may come before your lordships by way of a petition so in case that party does file that petition please do not pass any orders in favor of that party whether it be an ad interim or an interim order without hearing me okay so that's the purpose of a caveat so hear me before passing any order in favor of the proposed petitioner okay so the one who files the caveat is known as a caveator c a v e a t o r the person who files the caveat is known as a caveator who would be a party respondent in the writ petition which may be filed and the person who is likely to file the petition as in the petitioner the proposed petitioner he would be the caveat c a v e a t w -E. okay so the proposed petitioner would be the caveat so the caveat by filing a caveat ensures that no interim or ad interim order is passed against him behind his back without hearing him okay so therefore an averment in your petition to the effect that a caveat whether you have received any caveat notice or not is very important because for instance take an example uh take an take a case for instance uh kangana was supposed to uh, file a petition so bmc apprehended that and bmc had already filed a caveat so in that case no stay order could have been passed without hearing bmc okay kangana must have mentioned in her petition that she has been served with a caveat notice as in the bmc has filed a caveat and she has received a copy of bmc's caveat notice so she must have mentioned in her petition that a caveat is received and we are we have served a copy of the caveat uh, we have served a copy of the petition to the bmc but there could be instances though the general rule is that the other side has to be heard but as far as ad interim order is concerned the courts in certain cases do pass ad interim orders without hearing the other side okay so therefore the caveat assumes with great importance now that brings us to slightly another point just diverting for a minute as to what is an interim order and what is an ad interim order now uh, an interim order is an order which is passed generally after hearing both the sides and which is to operate till the final disposal of the red petition whereas an ad interim order is in certain cases passed ex parte without hearing the other side when there is a case made out for an extreme urgency so for instance uh, say in kangana's case the, she got a notice that it was being demolished on that very day therefore she urgently moved the court and the court granted an ad interim now an ad interim is to operate 
until the interim application is heard okay so till the hearing takes place for grant whether to grant the interim relief or not so till that time that order which operates is known as an ad interim order it can be passed ex parte or in certain cases it is passed even when the other side is present okay but the ad interim order the life of an ad interim order is only till the hearing of an interim application so it's at up to the interim stage whereas an interim order is an order which operates till the final disposal of the writ petition okay so coming back to our averment there has to be an averment as regards a caveat whether you have received a caveat notice or not the next averment is in respect of the court fees now in case of uh, writ petitions uh, you have to again refer to the court fees what should be the applicable court fees so the relevant laws whichever high court you are going to you will look up the rules of that particular high court to see and check what should be the court fees that is to be paid roughly speaking if it's a petition under article 226 of the constitution as far as bombay high court is concerned the court fees are rupees 250 per petition so suppose there are four petitioners it would be 250 into 4000 rupees so you have to mention an averment that uh, the petitioners or the petitioner has paid a court fees of rupees so and so uh, thereafter after you have done all this then you come to the another most important part as i began by saying when you are drafting a petition you must be clear as to what are the reliefs that you intend to claim seek uh, from the court so as far as the prayers are concerned they are very very important so in a writ in a writ petition the next part would be you would uh, ask for whichever applicable writ uh, as the case may be so for instance if you are asking for a writ of sorcerer array uh, generally you would word uh, the wording of the prayers would be you would specify the order in great detail as as to order dated so and so past in whether it be appeal number so and so or revision number so and so or in case number so and so passed by so and so authority so you will say that this honorable court be pleased to call for the record and papers and proceedings of case number so and so from respondent number so and so and after perusing uh, and ascertaining the legality and validity of the order dated so and so passed by so and so respondent be pleased to quash and set aside or be pleased to issue a writ of sarsharai or a writ in the nature of sarsharai and be pleased to pass appropriate orders or directions to quash and set aside order dated so and so passed by so and so authority which is annexed at exhibit abc whatever to the present writ petition that would be that would form part of your main prayer you also need to seek interim prayers and ad interim prayers so your interim prayer would be that pending hearing and final disposal of the writ petition this honorable court be pleased to stay the effect operation and implementation of order dated so and so or if it's a notice of notice dated so and so and you further ask for ad interim in terms of that interim prayer okay apart from that you can also ask for costs and a general blanket prayer saying that such other orders as this honorable court may deem fit in the facts of the case after you have done all this uh, the next important part is the signature so you sign the petitioner sign as well as the advocate for the petitioner signs mentions the date on which it is signed and the place where it has been signed thereafter the most important part is verification clause now the verification clause you will find uh you'll find verification clause in the rules so whether it be the bombay high court original side rules or the bombay high court appellate side rules so you have the format of the verification clause to tell you in simple terms it would be i any if there are multiple petitioners any one petitioner can affirm the petition so then i mr x petitioner numbers for instance 2 age so and so occupation so and so residing at so and so address do hereby solemnly affirm that what is stated in paragraphs numbers say 1 to 5 is based on my own knowledge and whatever is stated in paragraph numbers say 6 to 12 is based on information 
and legal advice, which I believe to be true. And whatever stated in para number 13 are my prayers. Okay. So this is how the verification clause proceeds. Uh, below the verification clause, the petitioner has to sign before the concerned authority affirming the petition. So if you're affirming the petition in the high court, you sign before an officer of the court by showing your uh, proper uh, proof, identification proof, whether it be Aadhaar card or PAN card or any other proof. And you affirm, as in the petitioner affirms before the authority. The other option is the pet petitioner can get it notarized before any authorized notary and uh, get the petition affirmed. Now, another important part, depending on which court you are filing it, each court has got its own rules. So, taking for instance, if you're filing a red petition on the original side of the High Court, we'll refer to the Bombay High Court original side rules, where what should be the manner in which you number the paragraphs, how you number the exhibits, what should what should be the line spacing? Like these are important things because once you file the petition, you get what is known as a lodging number or a stamp number, which is a temporary number. Thereafter, your petition is scrutinized by the officer of the court and he would raise office objections. So for instance, if it's not in compliance with the rules, original side rules, for instance, those objections would be raised. And unless and until you remove those objections, your number will, petition will not be numbered finally. So for instance, you are required to have double spacing. You need to set, keep a fixed margin on the left hand side and the right hand side. If you don't keep proper margins, suppose the documents which you have annexed as exhibits are not legible, or for instance, they are in vernacular language. In that case, those office objections would be raised. Therefore, when you are drafting the pe petition and preparing the memo of the petition, you should be aware of all these procedural aspects as well. So as to avoid as minimum uh, objections as far as possible. In spite of your best efforts, be rest assured that some or the other objection would definitely be raised by the uh, court associates. Uh, but your eff uh, effort should be as far as possible to minimize those objections. Uh, another important thing, so once you have prepared your draft of the writ petition, there are several things that you need to attach to it in order to complete your complete memo of petition. So what all things are there? Uh, I think I have run out of time. I'll just quickly wrap up in five minutes. Uh, so you need an index and a synopsis. Now you'll be surprised to know that even for how to prepare or how to draft an index and synopsis, there are what are known as practice notes, which have been issued by the High Court. Now, uh, for all those who are in the final year, uh, you may have a look at amended practice note number 51 capital A, which you'll find on the official website of the High Court. That lays down how, a how an index and a synopsis is to be prepared. So in a synopsis, you have to write the challenge in brief, as in what are you claiming in the petition. So that has to be in 10 to 15 lines. Then you prepare a list of dates in a tabular form. So you list out the important dates and what are the corresponding events. And if you have an extra supporting document, then the exhibit number and the page number. There again, the description cannot exceed four lines. Then you have points to be urged, basically your legal grounds. So each of those grounds, you cannot exceed three to five lines when you're writing it in the synopsis. So all these would be crucial for all those who intend to do internships, as well as those who are just in the final year, because these are the things that you'll get to prepare when you join a law chamber in the first instance. You would not get to draft a writ petition on your first day. You'll get to prepare the index and synopsis. So you should be aware about these things. So amended practice note 51A will come to your aid. Apart from that, uh, you annex a vakalatnama. Again, the, pro the format of a vakalatnama is given in the rules itself. So you have to, there are forms attached to those rules. So it has to be in that specified form. Apart from that, you also annex the memorandum of registered address. Now that is important because if the court has to serve any notice to you, to the petitioner, then you have to state what should be your, what is your memorandum of registered address. You can give your lawyer's address because then the court will issue any notices if required to your advocate. Uh, yeah, I'll just answer the questions at the end. Uh, thereafter, you have 
what is known as list of documents. So suppose, for instance, you have annexed exhibit A, B, C, D, E, F, G, suppose 10 exhibits. Then you prepare a separate list of documents where you write down the description, copy of so-and-so notice, copy of so-and-so order. You prepare a list of documents uh, after the memorandum of address. Thereafter, you also annex all the exhibits and then the affidavit in support of the petition. So in the affidavit in support of petition, uh, you say that whatever you have stated in the petition is true to your own knowledge or whatever is stated in the remaining paragraphs is based on information which you believe to be true. And that affidavit again has to be affirmed before the officer of the court or it has to be notarized. Another additional requirement if you're filing a petition on the original side of the High Court is you have to annex a certificate under Rule 636 of the Bombay High Court rules, original side rules. Now it can be uh, either 636-1A or 1B, depending on whether the petition lies before the division bench or the single judge. Uh, now, writ petitions can lie either before the division bench or the single judge. Now, how do you determine that? Broadly speaking, uh, under rule 636-1, you have instances under subrule A and B or clauses A and B where Cases which would lie before the division bench have been listed out and cases other than that which would lie before the single judge have been listed out. So accordingly, you have to prepare the certificate saying that, if, so for instance, if you are seeking a writ of mandamus, then obviously it would lie before a division bench. But if you are seeking a writ of certiorari to quash any order, then it would lie before a single judge. Uh, similarly, if you are seeking a writ of habeas corpus, it would lie before a division bench. So accordingly, you... Uh, mention in the certificate whether it's under rule 636-1A or 1B, depending on whether it's liable to be heard by a, a division bench or by a single judge of the High Court. Okay, so with this, you complete your complete draft of the writ petition. So your memo of writ petition will be complete. You are required to stitch it uh, in a particular manner and then submit it for lodging along with payment of court fees. Now, of course, you also have the option of e-filing, uh, but sadly, as on date, the Bombay High Court does not have the facility for the filing of writ petitions through the e-mode. You do have, at the district level, it has started now, e-filing has started, but as far as the writ petitions are concerned, so far, at the Bombay High Court, I think that will happen soon, but for the time being, you have to file it physically, but then you have an option for online payment of court fees. Okay, so that the court fees part, you can do it online. But as far as the filing of the petition is concerned, you'll have to lodge it in the central centralized filing section of the High Court. Uh, so this is as far as filing of a writ is concerned. Uh, just to add uh, a couple of things, if you have to file a PIL, as I told you earlier, the only difference would be that the petitioner would be espousing the cause on, uh, on behalf of several persons. So the format remains the same. Only in the initial cost title, where we mention writ petition number so and so, you will write PIL petition number, public interest litigation petition number so and so. Only two additional things that you need to incorporate are apart from the original side or the appellate side rules for PILs, you have got separate PIL rules. So each High Court and the Supreme Court has got its own PIL rules. So the Bombay High Court has got the PIL rules of 2010. So you will have to make additional averments in your petition that you have no other interest, uh, uh, no personal interest, that you are uh, bona fide pursuing this petition on behalf of so and so persons. So an additional affidavit in the petition has to be uh, added to your uh, writ petition in terms of Rule 7 ABC of the PIL rules. Additionally, you also need to uh, an annex a certificate under Rule 10 of the PIL rules and an additional government that in case an adverse order is passed or in case the court comes to the conclusion that the petition was not filed bona fide, as in it was with some ulterior motives or bad intentions, then you undertake, as in the petitioner undertakes to pay a certain amount of, a certain amount as in by way of costs. Okay. You must have heard recently in the news, there was in the news, that one politician of the opposition party in Maharashtra had filed a PIL petition. The court said you first deposit rupees 5 lakhs as a deposit so that in case we pass an adverse order against you, those 5 lakhs would be used towards the costs. 
Okay, so that these are additional things which would come in a PIL petition. Otherwise, the format of the writ petition applies as it is when you are filing a PIL petition. Okay, so with this, uh, I conclude my session. Uh, again, I would like to repeat that this is something which will learn as in when you hands-on start drafting petitions over a period of time uh, from your seniors, from your colleagues. This is not something which is to be uh, learned through reading of books, but nonetheless, very important to read the procedural laws which are applicable to ensure that your draft is in consonance with those uh, rules. And obviously, knowledge of substantive law is very, very important in order to formulate your grounds. Okay, so with this, I conclude my session on drafting of writ petition. I thank uh, all of you for the patient uh, hearing. If you have any questions, please ask me. Uh, I would request the host, Nadeem, uh, to please uh, read out any of the questions that may yes. have been posted in the chat box. Thank you so much for such a thorough step-by-step -step process of taking us through the step-by-step -step process of drafting a red petition. Uh, if anyone has any question, they can ask the question in the chat box or you can raise your hand and we'll unmute you. And you can directly ask uh, advocate. Thank you, sir. We have a first question. If under yeah. some proof, I, I, should I read it? Okay, yeah, please read it. Yeah. So the first question is if under some provision of act, the original jurisdiction lies first in district court, can the party approach high court first and the act is copyright act? Uh, no, the answer is no, because as I told you earlier, uh, you have to first exhaust your remedy before the court of first instance. So it's also called as a court of first instance or a trial court. So generally, you first exhaust your remedy before the first court or first instance of the trial court, and only thereafter you come before the higher appellate authority, or even by way of a writ before the high court or the supreme court. So you first need to exhaust your earlier remedy before the uh, subordinate uh, forum, and only then you have to come before the high court. Again, this is no hard and fast rule. If it's a gross case and the court deems it fit, the court high court can exercise a jurisdiction directly, even if you have not exhausted the alternate remedy. But again, it's a discretionary remedy. It's in the discretion of the court. But as a matter of uh, unwritten rule, a matter of practice, which is followed, you first exhaust the first remedy before the first court. To give you an instance, a uh, very, uh, very fresh instance, uh, as you know, you have an option of filing a writ either before the high court or the Supreme Court. So if you go in the high court under 226 or before the Supreme Court under 32, of course, uh, to a certain extent under 226, it's wide enough because you can approach the high court, not just for enforcement of fundamental rights under part three of the constitution, but you can also in, uh, approach the high court under 226 for enforcement of other legal rights. Now that is something which you cannot have if you go under article 32 before the Supreme Court, because under 32, it is only for enforcement of your fundamental rights under part. It's not for enforcement of your other legal rights. To give you an example, uh, just a day back, just two days back, the former Mumbai police commissioner approached the Supreme Court directly by way of a writ petition under Article 32, wherein he has challenged his transfer from being the Mumbai police commissioner to the DGP of Home Guards. And he has also asked for a relief which is in the nature of writ of mandamus uh, to hand over the investigation to CBI or ED as regards his allegations against the Home Minister of State of Maharashtra. Now, the Supreme Court refused to entertain the petition, saying that you can't come directly by way of Article 32. You have a remedy. First, approach the High Court under Article 226. And if you don't get any relief, you can come to the Supreme Court. So again, there's no, no specific bar under Article 32, but it's a matter of, or even under Article 226, but it is a matter of uh, practice, which is followed. It's a matter of self-restraint, which is exercised by the higher judiciary, that it will generally not entertain a petition directly if you have got any other alternate remedy. I hope I have answered this question. Uh, so, uh, if I may chime in. 
actually sir uh, this is sort of like a uh, thing uh, that uh, the jurisdiction is coming into play and actually it is in regard with copyright and it is uh, like uh, basically between the two copyright society and the uh, the defendant is basically uh, a website which will be uh, giving out the songs or uh, this uh, like uh, the audio songs out on their website you can download it and you can play it out and make video out of those song like a karaoke so sir the jurisdiction is coming into play because according to the copyright uh, uh, this and according to the judgment given previously the jurisdiction is according to the uh, the petitioner where they where their business has been conducted but as the website uh, the defendant uh, the website is all over like india so there is no particular jurisdiction so uh, can we get an interim relief directly from the high court instead of going to the uh, the district court because district court has jurisdiction to that district only so we will be seeking jurisdiction for uh, like a better uh, like high court can give a jurisdiction all over maharashtra or uh, or uh, uh, once we exhaust the high court uh, like uh, whatever judgment comes then we can approach the supreme court so my view was there that the jurisdiction is coming into play so at that time can we seek interim relief ad interim relief from the high court directly instead of going to the district court okay uh, now leaving aside the facts of this particular case uh, the basic principle of which court would have jurisdiction apart from the territorial jurisdiction and where the subject matter is situated uh, it, you have to refer to section 16 to 20 of the code of civil procedure so if it's a civil suit that you are filing generally it's at the place where the defendant resides or generally carries on his business or where the registered office of the defendant is situated now in a given case if you say that the defendant has got uh, area of operations all over the country and uh, it has got obviously though it has got uh, all over the country it would definitely have a registered office at one particular place so then where that particular place is situated you can file it in the concerned court where the defendant has got its registered office alternatively uh, if you see that it has got offices all over the country then where the cause of action according to you has arisen you can file it within that jurisdiction okay uh, any other questions Uh, so, sir, uh, seeking the ad interim relief or interim relief, uh, we can directly approach the high court in that sense because, as I said, the jurisdiction is expanding because yes, the circulation will. Even case you can, but if the other side raises any objection as regards the jurisdiction, then the court will look into it. So, if the if the court is prima facie satisfied at the ad interim stage, at least for the grant of ad interim relief, that it needs to be granted, then it, you are through. Until the defendant appears and raises an objection to the jurisdiction of the court. Any right. other question? No, sir. Thank you. Any Thank other you, Any other participant has a question? Yes, sir. There's one other question. Uh, uh, can a district court use local language for hearing? Yeah, of course it does. In fact, uh, in the state of Maharashtra, uh, the language of the subordinate courts is Marathi. Okay, so all the pleadings. can be in marathi and in fact uh, there is an order passed uh, by the high court as well where at least 50% of the judgments have to be in marathi even the arguments take place in marathi in all the courts uh, in all the subordinate courts in the state of maharashtra so barring a few courts uh, in mumbai predominantly uh, even in the bombay city civil court petitions are filed in english argued in english orders are passed in english but uh, if you go to uh, district courts outside mumbai or even the courts of civil judge junior division or civil judge senior division you will find that there are many judgments which are actually passed in marathi in fact 
the lawyers are encouraged to argue their cases in marathi and in fact to prepare their petitions also in marathi and the reason for that is to have access to justice the common man needs to know what he is signing what petition he is signing what is he affirming and he also needs to know what is being argued in a court of law at the same time if the judgment is in marathi it helps the litigant to know what order has been passed against him so in fact all the subordinate courts are encouraged to pass orders in marathi and in fact to conduct their proceedings in marathi so in fact many of you uh, if you do intend to practice outside mumbai and you are very well versed in marathi let me tell you that it will be a big bonus for you to draft your petitions in marathi let me share one uh, instance which was shared by one of my seniors uh, this was a case in uh, a remote uh, court quite far away from mumbai and uh, that was a case where the local lawyer had been engaged by one of the parties and there was a multinational corporation on the other side they had engaged a big counsel who went from mumbai to appear before that court of civil judge junior division the plaintiff had prepared all his averments in marathi his lawyer also argued the case in marathi and they had taken a big counsel a big leading senior counsel from mumbai and whose mother tongue was not marathi and he was not well versed in marathi and he faced a great lot of difficulty he even raised an objection before the judge the court of civil judge junior division that what is this they are arguing in marathi i don't understand tell them to give me translations or you uh, i need translations or tell them to argue in english to which the response of the judge the presiding officer was that he is entitled as a matter of right to argue it in the state language before the court of first instance and no such orders or directions can be given to him to give translations and you won't believe that in spite of having such a powerful uh, in spite of having such a powerful leading senior counsel who was very well versed in law because he had no knowledge of the language of the court the other side succeeded in getting an order against him so let me tell you uh, for those who are not able to speak uh, speak fluent english or not able to draft in english you don't need to feel uh, disheartened obviously you have to work on it uh, during the course of your next 5 years or 3 years whichever year you are in studying in glc it's definitely an asset to study and master english language as far as drafting is concerned again you no, no need to use any flowery language no need to use jargons and big words while you are drafting it has to be in simple language as long as you are incorporating all the facts and all legal points that's more than sufficient so you don't need an extraordinary knowledge of english language but at the same time if you are an expert in your local language whether it be marathi in this state or whether it be hindi or tamil telugu kannada whichever language whichever state you belong to and if you intend to go and practice there then your knowledge of your local language will be of great benefit to you so knowledge of your mother tongue will be of extreme importance the only thing i must confess having uh, participated in two state level marathi moot court competitions that the marathi legal language is not that simple as you may feel though your you, your mother tongue may be marathi to draft a petition or even to argue your case in marathi in strict legal language of marathi is really difficult for that you need to take extra efforts yeah anything else i will just ask one last question Time. yes uh omkar you can uh, unmute yourself and ask the question yes. good evening sir uh thank you for such an exhaustive talk on this topic of drafting of writ petition uh, sir my question is how far is it important to have a locus standi while filing a writ petition especially that of mandamus prohibition or certiorari correct so locus standi is the most important thing in the absence of having any locus you cannot have a petition so as i started by saying that if you are asking for a writ of mandamus you must establish that you have a legal right uh you must have a legal right and that you have made a demand that that right has been violated and therefore you have made a demand for justice and 
still their, uh, the authority has not uh, acted positively and has not given you justice and therefore you are coming before the court so that's the manner in which you establish your locus that you that a legal right inheres in you or that you have a fundamental right you made a demand for that right and in spite of demand it has been denied to you and therefore you are approaching the court by way of a writ jurisdiction or even otherwise in case of a writ of certiorari if that order has been passed against you then obviously you are aggrieved by it you are uh, it, it is an order which has got civil consequences or your legal rights are affected and therefore you have a locus to come before the court so as i began by saying that the first paragraph in your red petition would generally consist of the gist of the petition and the second para would be the description of the party so there as a petitioner you would say that you are so and so and that how you have got locus to file the petition so locus obviously is most important not just in a pil petition but even in a red petition yes okay sir okay thank you sir thank you nadim thank you sir Uh, I would like to invite our student coordinator, Prajula Shivika, to give the word. Thank you, Nadim. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, I, Prajula Shivika, would like to take the opportunity on behalf of Government Law College National Service Team Unit to to thank Advocate Sagar Rani Sir for giving us his precious time and enlightening us with his knowledge. Thank you, sir. uh now i would also like to thank our programming officer kritika ma'am for always supporting and encouraging us our principal asmita vaidya ma'am for her constant support and all the participants for joining us today thank you everyone yeah thank you thank you everyone thank you so much sir uh, all the participants uh, please thank you, uh, keep checking the website for more lectures have a good day everyone Thank you sir